Oh, it was a magnificent aeroplane for its day. The fleet air arm had really suffered very badly from inadequate aircraft. Due, I think, to a lack of appreciation in the admiralty of what naval aviation was all about. And when the war came, it caught us with aircraft which were really considerably inferior to those of the enemy. And this was possibly, at its, particularly at its worst, in the fighter arena. And then suddenly we came these, there came these um, wildcats from America under the lease land arrangement. <coughs> and they were a total revelation to us because they had been designed from scratch for area, aircraft carrier um, operations. It was as different as chalk from cheese, really. Uh, yeah, the skewer ostensibly was a dive bomber stroke fighter. It was quite a good dive bomber, but it certainly was a very poor fighter. And um, it was slow, it was not particularly maneuverable, and it was very much underpowered, whereas the Wildcat had a very powerful engine. It was a light, quite a light aircraft, very nippy indeed, uh, rather like an angry bumblebee, frankly. And um, it was much better armed. It had everything, in fact, that the skewer didn't have. But, of course, it wasn't meant to be a dive bomber. It was purely a fighter, whereas the skewer, to its, in, to its defense, uh, it was meant to do two jobs, and that's always a difficult thing to ask of an aircraft. Whereas the Wildcat, they were rugged. Uh, they had uh, an innovation in the fact that they had what is called a sting hook, uh, an arrestor hook, which came out of the tail of the aircraft as opposed to being under the belly of the aircraft, which we had. This made it much more simple to catch an arrestor wire than with the belly type. And also they were armed with um, 0.5 machine guns, which um, at that time were non-existent in this country. We were all using 0.303. So we were quite heavily armed. And you could also reload these, um, or recock, not reload them, but recock these aircraft from the cockpit in the event of a jam, which again was an innovative feature. They had an extremely reliable radial engine and um, they also had excellent ditching qualities which for a naval aircraft of course was very very necessary so altogether they were extremely popular and very effective it was a lovely little airplane i loved it it was very very maneuverable uh, in fact probably one of the most maneuverable fighters uh, other than the Japanese Zero that came out of the uh, the Second World War, I think. Uh, so the, the early ones were a bit difficult because they didn't have automatic undercarriage. You had to wind the undercarriage up. Um, and there again, the first ones we had, uh, I think, were originally designated either for the French or the Belgium Air Forces, and the most or a lot of the instruments were in metric and kilometres instead of what we've been used to. That took a bit of converting to start with. But I, I used to love the market. I flew them a lot, yeah. The second decision, having been chosen for the fighter school at Yeovilton, was whether you went into the Seafire or the Wildcat. And it was my understanding that if you were a big chap, supposing you were six feet six and 17 stone, you would not go in the sea fire because of a tiny, tiny cockpit. Well, I was not particularly big. I was only, I, I was 12 stone and five, five feet 10, I suppose, 10 or 11. So I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's what we were led to believe. So I went into the Wildcats room and it didn't worry me one bit, although the Spitfire had all the um, 
recognition as being a wonder. It was, it was iconic, wasn't it, the Spitfire at that time, Battle of Britain and all that. Uh, but I wasn't disappointed at all. But I remember how amazed I was at the size of the Wildcats fuselage. It was like a huge barrel, and you had to help someone get you, help you to climb up onto the wing and then climb into the cockpit. It, it had wings like planks, absolutely squared wings, straight wings, a huge barrel under uh, body, an undercarriage which was like a prammed wheels, um, no power undercarriage. You had to wind it up and down. Um, but I wasn't disappointed at all. I, 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 I had neutral thoughts about being staggered by the size of the, the, the fuselage. So that was my first impression. Well, unlike the other aircraft I've described to you, the Wildcat was built for carrier flying. American built. Grumman. And it was very sturdy. Uh, it had its vices and nuisances. The undercarriage, for example, wasn't hydraulic. You had to wind it, crank it up with a handle. And it was 28 turns, I can still remember that, to get the wheels up and 28 turns to get the wheels down. It had to be done manually. Apart from that, though, it was built for bouncing onto a deck. You could fairly thump it down. Uh, sturdy wheels. Fairly narrow, but it didn't matter if you caught a wire. Very good deck landing aircraft. Very good fighter aircraft. Obsolete slow, could take any amount of punishment, very manoeuvrable, multi-purpose, bombing, got front gun, rocketing, um, very versatile. In a dogfight, it could acquit itself well, not because of its speed, but it was jolly slow. It was a pleasant aircraft to fly. It was uh, a bit heavy on the controls, long before powered controls. Um, but I enjoyed flying the Wildcat, and it was a good deck landing aircraft. It was a good military, all-purpose. Uh, I think we were called an assault squadron, because we were used, certainly in my operational days during World War II, for ground attack or close air support. We were up at six at the end, it was a beautiful aircraft, uh, comparable to the Hellcat. Um, I don't know, the other thing it was, of course, the Spitfire had no range. As soon as you got the bugger up, to bring it down again. Whereas we could go for four hours. An American aircraft with a long range tank. <laughs> The early models particularly suffered quite a lot from engine failure. Um, I don't know how true it is, but they did say that the Wright Cyclone engine that they were originally fitted with uh, was a civilian type engine which was being boosted up for aircraft uh, for military service and consequently didn't quite take it very well. So there were a lot of engine failures, yeah. And once we arrived in Nairobi, it was seen that our aircraft, which had been in the desert without any serious backup, because we relied on the Air Force for spares, and the Air Force didn't have any Hellcat, Wildcats or Martlets to operate. So if we needed engine spares, it was discovered that the Liberator engine was much the same engine as the one we were using, and we could adapt to Liberator engine. But if it was other spares, they virtually had to be made at the time to suit the aircraft. But because they were a fairly old mark of Wildcat Martlets, they were to go into the training squadron and that we were to take new Wildcats which had come out from America in crates and were going to be assembled in Nairobi. And they were with Wright Cyclone engines instead of the uh, Pratt & Whitney, twin Pratt & Whitney's that we had had on our Martlets. These aircraft, I think there were about 25 of them, were assembled at uh, Nairobi. We were kept on to flight test them, and it soon became apparent that there had been a certain amount of sabotage 
with the engine construction because out of any three aircraft that flew, at least one would have engine trouble and would have to land with an engine that had either failed or was uh, severely starved of oil. The workshops couldn't understand exactly what was wrong, but later I was told that what had happened, a certain amount of sabotage in the engine manufacture in the States had ensured that bits of cotton waste were left floating around in the oil systems of the engine, and these could jam up in the valves or in the restricted passages and cause engine failure. Because of this, and because it was well understood, um, the aircraft were very suspect. We were given six aircraft to fly down to South Africa, to Durban, where two of our carriers, the uh, formidable and the then illustrious, were coming through from the Far Eastern Station and were going round and it was said at that time either to Gibraltar to take part in a Malta convoy or to the UK. And these aircraft were acquired down there by Formidable as spares for her to uh, take on board. So the order was to fly the six aircraft for at least three hours each around the airfield at Nairobi to ensure that the engines were going to continue to operate and we did this and the aircraft proved satisfactory and so we set off to fly them down to Durban sorry this would took place in December 1942 and the six of us took off in the afternoon I was the last one off and as I climbed out behind the other five my engine started blue smoking and his smoke came from underneath the cowlings and past the cockpit and past the side of the aircraft and we'd known before that this was a sign of incipient failure in the engine. And so I turned straight back from the formation without ever having caught them and got into a circle on the airfield itself from the height that I'd reached, which was just about, just under a thousand feet. By the time I got halfway down the airfield, the engine had seized up solid, but I was in a position to put the wheels down and land back on the airfield again. Another failing with these aircraft right from the word go had been that the radio telephone communications in them had never worked. We were never in touch one with the other throughout the squadron <clears throat> because the um, transmitter receivers um, hadn't stood up to whatever it was was required by us. So I was unable to tell the rest of the squadron that I had landed back and they were unable to count up to six for about the next half hour, so at the end of which they got a bit worried and decided they'd better turn back and see where I was. The Seafire, or really the Spitfire to start with, had an inline engine, a Merlin, with a coolant system. And if that, if you got a splinter in there, that was the end of that engine. And also, it was impossible to ditch Cox Blue because you had a radiator scoop and it, and it was a low wing monoplane. And it was better to bait out of a sea fur. It, um, it was also impossible to land. I and mean, when we lost at Salerno, I think 90 out of 120 planes for deck accidents, um, which Bolden always swore that it was due to the flat calm, so they couldn't judge heights. But they, wasn't it bounced like a tennis ball? You've seen pictures of it, see. It. Whereas American aircraft, you come and, oh, from this height and cut the throttle, and the thing just dropped like a brick bang. There it stayed, mostly. Um, and they had radial engines, Pratt and Whitney and the Wasp and the, and the Wright cyclone. And I've, I've brought an aircraft back to the right side of the three of its cylinders damaged by ACAC. Lose oil, but they still churn around. And uh, we had a mid wing monoplane. We were practically, when you got used to it, you could, you could ditch that thing and get into your dinghy without getting your feet wet, practically. It was a, it was a wonderful thing because it floated and it. Not as fast, perhaps, as the Seafire. And we couldn't catch up with the 88s and things like that, the early, early American aircraft. 
But they were much more rugged, very tough. With a sea fire, when you climbed into a sea fire or a spitfire, the stick came right up to your jaw. And, and you seemed to get the feel, once you were in the cockpit, that it was tailor-made for you. Flying a Spitfire was like flying a, a, a tailor-made suit. You were part of it. And it responded quite beautifully to any handling you care to impose on it. If you moved your control column one inch to, a, to the right, then the aileron came up one inch, shall we say. It was, it was so finely balanced, beautifully balanced. It was really a, a joy to handle. But when it came to putting it down on the deck, it was a nightmare. The American aircraft, and this applied, this was uh, due to both the Wildcat and the Corsair and the Hellcat. They were bigger and more robust altogether. They had a huge cockpit. The control column was not a spade grip like the Seafire. It was a, it was a, a sort of hand, just a, a broad fundamental stick with a, a little grip at the top. And you could stir it around quite happily without nothing happening. And if you wanted to move to to the right, instead of doing a little jink, you had to move it pretty harsh, and then it was, oh, what if you insist? And it would go off to the right to follow you through. But at the same time, when you close the throttle on these aeroplanes, they sure stopped flying. In other words, they came down quickly, and they had a wide, strong undercarriage that could take the thump on the deck. So, yes, they were built with deck landing in, in mind, whereas the British aircraft were not. And the Wildcat had had its undercarriage under the engine nacelle. You know, it was it, it tucked up. The wheels tucked up into the engine cowling, not into the body of the wing. And uh, you had to wind the undercarriage up. So when you got airborne, you were winding the as you were climbing into the sky. You were winding the flaming undercarriage up like this, and you had to wind a lot to get it up. And it was down here, you see, you were ducking your head down while you're winding this wretched thing up. And I once wound my head down, because it caught my tube, and you know, all that sort of stuff was being wound down. My head was being wound down as I was winding up, as I was uh, climbing. And, of course, you, you find your head being pulled down below the level of the cockpit. What the hell? Is wrong? So you had, to, you had to unwind, let your undercarriage... Now, up again, uh, down again, you see. So uh, every Wildcat, they never had any automatic fly, uh, undercarriage recovery. It was all lower by hand and raised by hand. Had to let it, you couldn't let it fly because it would, it would, might create a bit of havoc. You got very skilled at it. You, you really, you know, and your right arm got very strong. Uh, because it, it was, it was quite a heavy undercarriage. It wasn't assisted. You wound it up. <laughs> and once you're in the cockpit, bags of room, very you know comfortable airplane, and quite good visibility because you were very high up, and with the radio engine it was better, obviously, than the long inline engine, of, say, of the Seafire. So that there was good visibility, pilot visibility. No, it, was a, it was a nice airplane to fly, actually. And I think the difficult difficulty I found was the landing, actually, was getting it right, getting your landing approach right and the attitude right. And I felt I made a bit of a horlicks of it, I know, first one or two times, you know, getting the speed too fast. Um, and it just, you're having to get used to a totally different airplane, and it's getting the attitude right is the key. Um, and you're always liable to either get two nose down and too fast, or two nose up and getting too near the stall. When you've caught a wire and a carry in the fleet arm, your landing's finished. You don't have to do anything except switch the engine off. When you're landing in an RF or you're landing on an aerodrome and you touch down, the landing is not finished. And this is one of the pitfalls that we had. If we'd been flying a lot from a carrier and then we disembark in Malta or Alexandria, whatever we did, and to work, to, to work from an aerodrome, there are a lot of ground loops on those first landings because as soon as you've touched down, particularly an aeroplane with a narrow undercarriage, you have to fight a lot to keep it straight. Any side wind, crosswind, and you what they call ground loop, 
so it's a lot easier in that sense landing an aircraft carrier than landing on an aerodrome. It had a notoriously narrow undercarriage and it was oversprung laterally. It had a high wing, a single high wing, and if, it got, if you got caught in a strong crosswind on the ground, you'd often find the aircraft doing a voluntary, an involuntary ground loop over which you seem to have no control. <laughs> so it was more of a handful on the deck, on the ground, than it was in the air. Uh, it wasn't, a, it wasn't, as far as fighters go, it wasn't that fast. So I would describe it as a, a, a quietly efficient aeroplane with limitations, but at the same time it, it wasn't a rugged aircraft at all. It was a, a rather sensitive beast. And uh, the time I came to the fort, it was replaced by the Hellcat. It was a fairly flexible undercarriage. By that I mean it, it had plenty of hydraulic spring give in it. You could put it down and it, and it still wouldn't break or it still wouldn't burst a tyre. Whereas a sea fire was notorious for that sort of thing. Um, no, it didn't propose a particular... But again, if, if you were trying to manoeuvre the aircraft on deck and the carrier was turning into wind, then it could be quite tricky. Very tricky. And you, you've never felt more vulnerable as a pilot than when you're taxiing an aircraft on board an aircraft carrier manoeuvring into wind because there's not much you can do <laughs> you... <clears throat> I was appointed then to another squadron 893 which was equipped with American Grumman Wildcat F4F aeroplanes and going to be ship based and we didn't know at the time but eventually the aircraft carrier, which is a proper full Bucker fleet carrier, was actually most formidable, a full deck. Uh, and we worked up, that's, that's the term used for getting a squadron to work as a whole unit, formation of flying and everything like that, at a place called Donny Bristol, um, Firth of Forth. But this was the first time that our war had gone on the offensive, and America were with us. And uh, my ship, Formidable, was allocated the part of the North African coast of Algeria, Oran and Algiers. And it was decided that we, we, they were invading a French-owned uh, uh, part of the world, that if the French had thought this was a British invasion, they would fight. But if they thought it was an American invasion, they would accept America rather than Britain. It's still today. France and Britain, you know, we're not friends. So, when we came to do this invasion, we painted all our aeroplanes under American colours. And uh, mostly the aeroplanes, that they called them roundels, red, white and blue rings on the circle, painted on the side. Well, they were all painted out, and a white star was painted on, which the Americans, to distinguish American aircraft. So I flew an American aircraft in American colours. Uh, and it worked, because the Chargé d'Affaires in Algiers, it capitulated after uh, about three or four days, thinking that it was a, an American invasion. So it worked. Um, but I tell my American associates that I once flew as an American. <laughs> well, as fighter aeroplane, basically, there were uh, more than one squadron aboard. There were uh, two squadrons of, of uh, Wildcats, which they never used to call martlets. And there was a squadron of Sea Fires, uh, Spitfires. Uh, they couldn't follow the wings, so they had to be stuck on deck. And they were put on outriggers hanging over the sea. And then there was a squadron of Albacores, which were the torpedo aeroplanes. Uh, our function as fighters was either to escort the Albacores, who were on a torpedo mission, a torpedo U-boats or the Italian Navy or whatever it's going to be, uh, or umbrellas over the fleet to protect the fleet from enemy aircraft, fighters or bombers coming in, or to cover the actual landing, the troops who were doing the dirty work of landing. Um, that was the role uh, of fighter aeroplanes. 
addition to that, perhaps, a little bit of what they call AS patrol, anti-submarine patrols, when we ranged far away looking for U-boats. Uh, not that we could have done much to them. Bullets from the wings of a fighter aeroplane wouldn't damage a, a U-boat, but the radio could soon fetch a destroyer up or, or an albacore with a torpedo.